We pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hagwood of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. This is our 7 o'clock Bible study hour. Uh, I'm here in the sanctuary. I'm pretty sure that uh, some that may be coming, um, they're running a little bit late. I know I'm getting started late. Uh, a few minutes late on uh, this evening, so forgive me for that. But uh, we are here, and we are here to go through the process of studying the Word of God. Again, we're in Acts chapter 17 tonight, and we're going to go through, hopefully, to, through verse 15. That's the goal, uh, is to get through the 15, 15 verses on tonight. Uh, if I have to leave temporarily, uh, it's just to go to answer the door so that folks who are coming in can be let in. Uh, again, for those who are coming to the campus, uh, just make sure you use the side exit door uh, that's uh, closest to the entrance of the church. Uh, just make sure you use that, and we'll make sure that everything is taken care of from there. I do have my cam camera reversed on today because I've been having some issues with it. Um, so if you have comments, please, uh, I'll, I'll actually will be able to see them because I'm, I've got my camera reversed and I'm looking at myself as I talk, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to be able to get comments and things of that nature uh, as you may have them or even uh, questions that you may have in the midst of Bible study. So with that being said, again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, for those that are coming on board, uh, maybe your first time coming on board with regards to our 7 o'clock Bible study, welcome. And we just thank God for you. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to have a word of prayer um, as we get started, before we get started, so that we can make sure we consecrate this moment of discipleship uh, with the graces of the Holy Spirit and and and, uh, and the Holy Spirit's presence. So if you don't mind, please bow with, bow with me at this time as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, thank you, Lord, for yet another day that we have not seen. And thank you, Lord, for... Uh, getting to this place of the seven o'clock hour to go through Bible study on tonight. We thank you, Father, for all that you continue to do. Bless us and keep us. Give us what we need, Lord, for the journey and allow us, Lord, to embark upon your word in such a fashion that it allows us, O oh Lord, to see your light, to see, Lord, how you uh, uh, expose, O oh God, to us the greatness of your word and how directionally we should be, be, be living in our lives. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you meet us in this place. Many of us are tired, oh Lord, from the course of the day. We've worked all day and uh, have run errands and have done a host of things. Lord, we just ask, Lord, for some calm and peace, even in this moment, so that, Lord, we can absorb what you have in your word on tonight. Thank you for what you continue to do in our lives and bless us, Lord. And continue to give us what we need, Lord, for this journey as we continue, Lord, to press and push forward, oh Lord, as we press and push forward through life, oh Lord, but still, Lord, leaning and trusting on you. We love you, we praise you, we honor you, and we glorify your name. Bless, we bless your name, Lord. Thank you for all that you continue to do. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that being said, I, I see someone has just pulled up, so I'm going to be probably pulling off for a second be able to answer this door. So again, Acts chapter 17 is where we are on tonight. Again, Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 15. That's where we're going to kind of um, put our place there and I'm going to answer this door real quick. Y'all give me a second. That, that mic is on. Um, I just got it on the red mute right now, but when, if you have a question or comment, just grab it, click it, and it, it, it should, should vocalize. All right. So, again, as, as I said before, we're in Acts uh, chapter 17 tonight. I've um, been having, having, having problems with my phone, Deacon Melissa. For some odd reason, it, did, it happened during Sunday school. It just kept going and pausing for some odd reason, and I always, I always had to hit this resume, resume button. So what I decided to do was flip it. So now I'm looking at myself. So I'm seeing comments. I'm seeing all that now. And, and I think it might be a better way of actually doing it because of the simple fact that I can, if that thing does go back to resume, I can just hit it <laughs> and, keep, and, and be able to keep going. So we're at Acts 17 tonight. Uh, verses 1 through 15 is what we're going to attempt to get through again on tonight. And again, just bear with us as we go through the process of going through uh, this text and uh 
uh, this text tonight as well as the explanation. Please make sure that you comment, that you make sure you ask questions, because I can see those comments and questions as we go along through the process of the study. So what we ended last week is we ended with chapter 16. Ended with chapter 16 and um, Paul and Silas getting out of jail, okay? Uh, getting out of prison once again uh, for being unjustly in prison, okay? For spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And where we ended was I kind of talked about this whole aspect of Lydia um, again, that the uh, Paul and Silas had somewhere to go, um, had somewhere place to go, meaning after they had dealt with being in prison and things of that nature, that they went to Lydia's house in order to gain some level of peace, calm, restoration and renewal. The reality is, is that now what we're seeing is we're, we're starting to approach what is kind of tied to now kind of Paul's second missionary journey. And there are various places that he goes to. Uh, he goes to uh, Thessalonica, he goes to Athens, he goes to Berea. Um, I think there's another place that he goes, I'm trying to think of it uh, off the top of my head, Corinth. That's right, he went to Corinth. And so um, these journeys that are within chapter 17 and 18 kind of deal with that second missionary journey, specifically 17. I think 18 might get into the third missionary journey, but... Um, I have to look at the history on that just to make sure the connection is right. But one of the things that we're going to see is just these journeys that they're going on and what uh, is happening in the midst of those journeys. And tonight, and tonight we're going to focus on Thessalonica and Berea. And those are the individual places that Paul and Silas now have gone. And we're going to see some of their um, um, adventures and what kind of goes, what, what they've gone through and what they will go through in the midst of um, just evangelizing the gospel. Remember, we're talking about the beginnings of the church. And because of the tie-in of the beginnings of the church, they're now starting to make missionary journeys to all these different places of the known world at that time, specifically in the Roman Empire, because that was really, that was really what was not only known, but also kind of a power, a power center because of Roman occupation. So what we have here, and we'll get into the verses here in a second, is now Paul and Silas are beginning this journey into Thessalonica. And that's kind of the larger part of this pericope of scripture tonight. And then it uh, goes into Berea. And we're going to read through this. And I'm going to hit all 15 verses and go ahead and go through all of them. Go ahead and go through all of them. And then hopefully and prayerfully, um, we'll be able to touch on uh, quite a few things in the midst of the text on tonight. So with that being said, I want to read. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. And we're going to go through the entirety of the text, and then we'll rewind, go back to verse 1, and begin breaking a lot of these pieces down. Okay? So, Acts 17, verse 1. It says, When Paul and his companions, companions had passed through Amphipolis, in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where they were, Jew, uh, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas, in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have, who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Jason has welcomed them into his house. 
they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Verse 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they uh, received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowd, stirring them up. The believers immediately went, sent Paul to the coast. But Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word and may it truly sanctify us to the deepest roots of our heart. So what we see now is this connection of Paul and Silas now beginning to travel to another region, to Thessalonica. And you can't see this, but I have my study Bible with me. And it kind of shows where Thessalonica is. And I'm kind of making sure I get there. Thessalonica is kind of hovering uh, around the Aegean Sea. That's where the area is, just east of Greece. Okay? Just east of Greece. And Paul ends up getting there. He ends up getting there from the perspective of all of his travels uh, going back through, again, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and then he goes a little further west. That's where he's going, okay? And I'm looking at a map here that you all can't see. But eventually, it leads him to uh, Thessalonica and Berea, which were very, very close to one another, and they were right along the Aegean Sea along the coastline, okay? Now, what's interesting here is that they pass through these places, Apollonia and uh, uh, Amph 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 Amphipolis and Apollonia, and then they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. Now, I want you to see something here on their journeys. One of the things that Paul and Silas make it a point to do, wherever they go, they always head to the church. That is the very first thing that they do. They go to the church and they find the Jewish synagogue immediately. And I believe one of the reasons, and it's probably part of the Jewish custom in order to be able to do that, uh, to do that and find the Jewish synagogue, but there was always this reverence to God in whatever place they went. And they made it a point to find the house of God as soon as they got there. Very first thing they did, find the house of God and kind of get settled, okay? Because when doing the work of God, wherever you might be, you have to make sure that you find the closest sanctuary possible. And I'm not necessarily saying that it has to be a church house. I'm not saying it has to be a place like this that we're in right now. What I'm saying is that you need to be able to get around a body of common believers and to be able to resuscitate, to be able to get something to eat, to be able to rest, to be able to clear your mind, to pray, to be able to, when you're going to do the work of the Lord, this is why you need time to relax before going through the process of doing that. The house of God does a lot of things for us. One, it gives us a place of calm and peace. Okay? Whatever was going on during the course of your day today, and those who are online watching us now, Whatever was going on during the course of your day is something about getting into this hour or space that tends to calm things down. 
Okay? Um, I've had a busy day today. I know I have. I know, I know many people here have. But it's something when you get to the place of God's house where you're able to kind of level things out, to talk to God, to be able to, to loosen up, be for you don't have any constraints that you're worried about. You're not worried about a deadline you got to meet. You know, at work or something of that nature, all you're concerned about is I'm in God's house and I need God just to speak to me in this moment. I need God to relay messages to me in this moment. I need to be around common folk where we can open our Bibles up and be able to study the word of God in peace. <laughs> to be able to glean something uh, from the word of God that will help me through the tumultuous turmoil of my day. And that, that to me is something that we oftentimes just wash aside or we just take for granted. But it's something about getting to God's house and especially when you have been traveling. And I would say this to anyone, to say, say this to all of you, whenever you're on vacation or, or you're going somewhere, find a place, find a chapel, find uh, a church that may be open. It doesn't matter what denomination it may be. But just go in, even if, even if it's just for a moment, just to be able to be in that space. Or if you're not going to a physical place, wherever you land, wherever uh, you get to, whatever hotel you get to and, or, 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 or beach house that you end up, set up a place of sanctuary when you, soon, as soon as you get there. You will find that the rest of your vacation will, will literally, it, it'll, it, it'll begin to smooth itself out. Because you are now have set up the premise of God's spirit in that place and said, God, thank you for getting me to this place. Thank you for allowing us to get here, for allowing us to have a little bit of reprieve. Now, Lord, we consecrate this place right now in the name of Jesus. And even in the course of the next three days or week or however long you're there to be able to consecrate that moment. Because, yeah, you want to have fun on vacation, but when you when you put that staple of God on that on that thing, it just does something to the entire environment. I, I found um, in my twenty my twenty fifth year anniversary, we were all lined up waiting for the new class to come in. It's a tradition at Morehouse, and literally all alumni just lined up literally on both sides of the main main street, and the main street goes uphill, goes uphill, and all the kids got to walk it. Okay, have to walk uphill, walk up that hill. And then we have to walk it. Well, before we got started, somebody turned to me and said, do you think we need to have church? I said, yes, we do. I said, yes, we need, do need to have church. And literally, um, we got some scripture. I spoke for all of maybe, maybe eight, nine minutes. Eight, nine minutes. The brothers that were there, you could tell that it was just a matter of, man, yeah. Yeah, we need to hear this word today. And so, and people were getting excited. We're getting excited. And I was getting excited. But it's something about those moments, when you hand those moments over to God, that God does something extraordinary just out of this world with them that you can't even measure. And then you're like, after the fact, God, you, you did something in this moment. You did something in the space. So it's a good thing to be able to find that place of solace or to create it, to create it. Because when you when you say, you know what, we're going to pray right now. It may be as simple as that. We got here before we go anywhere, before we hit that beach and that sand, we're going to pray. And pray don't have to last 20 minutes. If you just pray and say, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. Thank you, Lord, for just being able to have some calm and space. Thank you, Lord. For uh, just letting us, what we're about to experience in the next few days or whatnot, what you will find is that God will permeate that entire space. And everything that you basically have done, you have covered that entirety of what you're about to do during the course of that, you know, vacation. Now, again, we're not talking about you going and evangel evangelizing, but what I'm saying is that there's something about the presence of God that helps to helps to bring things at ease. Even when you're entering a situation where you may not think it's dangerous, and it could be. That God is in the midst of that because you've already covered it in prayer. And that's what we're finding with Paul and Silas is that now 
They're coming, every time they go to a new place, they're finding the church. That's the first thing they do. And, and, and it's important to come, come to that realization. And I really, really feel for our, our, our younger generation now because a lot of that adage, unfortunately, is not given to them from the perspective of having a responsibility and an onus when they leave Charlotte. For example, that the first thing you need to do is you need to establish yourself a place to go, a safe haven, a church that you can go and be able to worship and be able to be fed in that place. That was one of the first things when I went out to college. That's one of the first things that my pastor told me. He said, look, he said, when you get down there, Sean, you need to find a church. You need to find a place that you can go. And I, and I ended up finding about actually three churches. Three churches. And I would, I would go, you know, go, go to those churches every Sunday. And sometimes it meant just staying on campus and going to chapel every Sunday. You know, and being able, being able to hear the word of God, hear singing and so forth there in, in that space. But once I, once I got my car down there, I started to venture a little bit. And I, uh, I started, we started going to uh, Salem, at that time, Salem Baptist Church, uh, where Jasper Williams, um, Jasper Williams is the pastor. And my, literally, my sophomore, junior, senior year, that's where we would be on Sunday. We would, we would be at the private, no, we would be at the early service. Uh, I was asking, asking a lot then. <laughs> we, but we would, be at, we would be at the traditional service and, um, and, and, and Jasper Williams, that's a preacher brother. And when you get in, you know, you knew you would get that word and you're going to be able to leave and have some peace. And I knew I could go and study and have a, um, uh, go and study after church. But before I go and study after church, I, I'm, I was going to OCB. I don't know what that is. Old Country Buffet. <laughs> Old Country Buffet. Because at that time, they had a buffet. For six dollars, at that at Buffalo, so we knew when we left Salem, where we had Buford Highway, <laughs> we going we going up to uh, up to uh, around uh, Buckhead and Bu uh, Buford Highway, and we going to OCB. So we get a good meal. Then after the good meal, we head back to campus, and then we literally probably take a nap, and, after, and the rest of the evening we'll be studying. That, that, that was kind of our setting. But it's just something about the Lord's house. And what we're seeing in the Acts is we're seeing the importance of getting to God's house. And that's why it's so important, even for First Mount Zion, for us, that you don't know who's coming into this town. Man, as much as, much as Charlotte is growing right now, now we got, we've got some folks that have been coming here, uh, coming. I've been, I've been seeing, you've been seeing them. And, and literally, some of them are starting to trick, trick into Sunday school now. And I'm like, Okay, so God, what are you saying? You know, and you know what? What are you, what are you doing in the midst of this? You know, and, and 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 we have to be ready with regards to welcoming those folks in. You know, there, there are folks that are coming here and visiting us because they're seeing us on the web or they saw us on Facebook or something of that nature, and they're coming to investigate. They come come to see what's going on because they're coming from different places across the country, and they're looking for a church. They're looking for a place they can come and a place that they feel they can call home. And church should always feel that way. So with that, when we get into verse, which is verse three, it says, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Then Jesus, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, uh, God-fearing Greeks, uh, and quite a few prominent women. So we see this now push of proclamation of the gospel, and it goes back to the central message that Jesus Christ was crucified. That he had to die in order that we might live, but was raised from the dead in order to show the conquering of death, hell, and the grave in order to obtain salvation if we choose to believe what he did saved us. And that becomes this, 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 this captivating, um, 
this captivating message that is the centerpiece of the church. Jesus died and he rose. Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And that is our centerpiece. And so he's going to these, these places and he's teaching this and folks are grabbing on to it. Okay? Now, I want, I want to ask this, I kind of want to ask this question. So, for, you know, for our church, you know, for our, you know, our neck of the woods, what, what, does, what does that look like, you know, from the perspective, not just on Sunday morning, but even from other things that we could do, other things that we could do or can do? In a good place to have. Teresa, hit no, hit the button. Hit yeah, the yeah. To turn green. Oh, turn green. Okay. We sit in a place where I know we have Bible study on Wednesday at church on on um, Sunday, but we're sitting in a place where most of the people around us need Jesus more than just twice a week. Mm. You know, um, it should be something going to invite people into First Mount Zion or at least on the campus to see that we are doing something, advertising something that pertains to giving your life to Christ. Not, you know, we always can feed or whatever, but most of the time, some people need their spirit fed. Mm -hmm. You know, and there should be something going on here to show that that is what First Mount Zion is about. That's what we were about a while ago, to show that First Mount Zion is not just a church. This is some people's home. Yeah. They come here to get fed uh, spiritually and physically, but mostly spiritually. So it should be something, to me personally, I think it should be something going on more than twice a week to show that we're here to help the community. You know. and, and Teresa, I, I totally agree with you. And I, this is where, you know, you, we have to try to attempt to be as creative as we can in regards to various the various things that we do that aren't tied to Sunday, aren't tied to Wednesday night. And figuring out how do you how do we bridge, make that bridge and bridge that gap and, and, and do as much as we can, you know, with what we have in order to be able to to extend Christ, you know, out to so many different people. You know, that's why I was so I was so high up on, you know, on the food truck event. Because, you know, food food is the enticer. Jesus is the hook. So so food is the enticer. When you smell the food, you you can eat immediately drift. Drift over to it. Um, and especially amongst us, you know, you know, in the African diaspora, uh, us as black folk, you know, it, it's just something about getting together and being able to fellowship. But I also look at it from the perspective of, okay, given the, 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 the pocket or the hotbed that we're in on West Boulevard and Remount, right here on this corridor, and we see, we see what's in our neighborhood. We see what's here. We see, we see also how it's changing, you know, and the different things that are going on because it's, it's a matter of trying to figure out how do, we, how, do, how do we do ministry outside of these walls or even we do them outside the walls in extent, meaning outside the fence and go elsewhere and so forth. But even if we did it immediately outside of the church, how, how do we bring that draw? You know, how do we bring individuals and people and so forth to know that they have a place that, you know, there are people who are, who are dealing with, um, who can't get groceries and so forth. But gas is 435 a gallon right now. You know, and with all the stuff that's going on in the world, you know, with inflation and things of that nature, it's, it's hard for folks just to live. And even with the little things that we have, even with the little food ministry that we do have, that helps a lot of people. It really does. And it probably could help more. But I, I oftentimes wonder, okay, who really knows that this is going on other than folks outside First Mount Zion? So, you know, is it a matter of being able to extend and say, hey, you know, right in the neighborhood, look, you can come here on, on Saturdays for about two to three hours if you need some food and so forth, we've got it. If you, if you got a place to store it, 
You know, for those who may be homeless, you know, they, it, that doesn't really help much unless it's something immediate that they can eat. But it's still something, you know, to be able to extend that and, and to do that. And this is where trying to be creative with partnerships and things of that nature is so important because it's not just the teaching and preaching of the word. No one may ever see this, you know, see the study or see the sermons on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning. But one of the things that I kind of glean, you know, glean from this is what can we do that literally is instantaneous? That literally you, you don't have to have a commitment to come really to come into these doors. And if you do, it's not really for long. So to be able to hand you something or put something in your hand, whether that's food or something, that you need, maybe that's clothes or something of that nature. But at least we become that haven and we're doing truly the work of Christ in this space. And prayerfully, hopefully folks will come up. You know, I, don't, I can tell you countless times I've gone, countless times I've gone out of that back door and literally somebody's been waiting for me there, you know, because they, they needed something. I had a man who, who was, a vet, he was a vet, disabled, um, partially disabled, and he was asking about, you know, I, you know, I, I need, I just need some food and so forth. And we had all the vegetables and so forth back there. I went back there, I went back there and just got got bags of stuff. And I said, how much can you carry, sir? You know, how much? He was like, he's, oh, I got this thing. He's rolling, rolling this thing. And I said, can you, will it, will it be too much on you? And so forth. He's like, no, no, no. He just put it in there. So I went in and put it in there. We had, we had folks here. I remember one, one uh, person came to the church, and. They didn't have any food in the house. And this person kept cutting. I had been here before, but he said, I didn't know there was a food ministry here. Well, he said, man, we, you know, we struggling right now, man. So I was like, dude, how many crates? I said, well, how many crates you need? What you need? I said, some frozen pizzas back there and some other things and so forth stuff you could put. And, and it wasn't that he was homeless. They had a house. She didn't have any food. And we literally filled his car up. Filled his car up. He said, man, he said, my mama sees this. He said, she's going to flip. And I said, this, this, is, this is the ministry of the church. And I oftentimes would tell people, I was telling Nathan um, on during graduation Sunday, this past Sunday, I said, man, whatever you do, whatever God blesses you in, blesses you with, I said, know this. Whatever it is that you need, man, we're here. We're here. I said, well, now we may not be able to, to, to give you the, the full extent, but we better give you something. We better pour something into you. So that's why this place means so much to a lot of people. And you never can take the church for granted because there are a lot of folks who are depending on this place, who are depending on First Mount Zion. But, Pastor, we're going to have to canvas the neighborhood. Yes. 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 And canvas the neighborhood and find out. You know, if we personally, when we run into these different people, if we go out giving out flyers or whatever, and let them know what we have, but also asking them what their needs are. Needs are. Yeah, because there may be some needs that we can meet, but we just don't know, you know, what it is that they need. So we're going to have to canvas the neighborhood and see exactly what it is that they need and what they're looking for, you know. <laughs> Deacon Melissa, and, and I think that's it's going to have to come to that, you know, where literally, you know, we go out in groups and, you know, we pick a, pick a day, literally, pick a day, and we start going down through the neighborhood and, and just going through block to block and just, and just talking to people, knocking on doors, and so and telling them that we're the church on the corner. We're, we're First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And, you know, we're just here to let one, let you know that we're here. And also, you know, you know what, what are some of your needs? You know, what, what are some of your physical needs? What, what are some of your spiritual needs? You know, and don't be surprised with the answers that you might get. Because some may be looking for something. There, there may be some who have a certain reputation or look at our church and say that, no, I'm not going over there. Oh, wow. Why, why, why is that? You know, and, and just and kind of try to canvas and figure out. Where, where where folks are because that's it helps us internally to figure out what do we need to do in order to do better outreach you know we, we, even within our own own community and I would tell people this is there's not missions is not just going over to Europe or Africa 
So missions is right here. It is right here in the very blocks that we're on. And we're sitting as a, as a beacon. That fence is not going up because someone just wanted to hand us some money. What they, what they did, they see this place as a beacon. They see this place as a beacon of light. And they want to say, okay, what can we do to make sure that they're able to do the mission of Jesus Christ? But we also internally have to start asking ourselves the question, you know, what do we need to do? And we got to start hit, you know, hitting the pavement and figuring that out. I'm sorry, go ahead, Teresa. Many of my pieces on the way to, to church uh, on Sunday morning, I had seen the, it's a family right around the corner here. And I had seen the little boy, and he run out to the street and he waved. And when we come through on time, he waved. I don't know if he's just waving at us or if he's just waving at a car. So one morning we came through, I didn't see him, but I saw, I guess that was his mom. I said, I'm looking for my friend, my little friend that waves at me. She said, oh, Carl? And she called him and he came around the corner and he was just waving. My son said, you don't even know that little thing. I said, yes, I do. His name is Carl. <laughs> you know, and I know that because mama told me that. I said, but... That's how, that's that, you know. You 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 start to have a conversation. I'm a baby man, and I I just love kids. But what if I'm going through that neighborhood or walking through that neighborhood, and they are outside? Maybe just maybe they are looking for a church. Mm -hmm. Well, I already know Carl. And Carl knows me because he's waiting. Mm -hmm. But you just, somebody's just waiting for you to invite them. Right, right, and ask. I mean, they're white. They're not expecting for us to say, hey, you know, I'm I'm at the church, I go to the church right around the corner. It's like within walking distance. Mm-hmm. That lady did not expect me to ask for her something that morning. Right. I know she did. But Carter, when we were coming through, Carter is standing outside with him, with dad is on the other side of the house, and he's just waving. Waving, exactly. You know, it starts somewhere. It, it, it really does. And, and, and you'll be surprised how much of an impact it has on someone's life just to ask the question or to give the invitation. To give the invitation of being able to come. Um, no, she didn't have to. I, I was, yeah, I, I, she uh, disagreeing. But, but, but the invitation of asking. I know folks who went out to college because someone said that they could. Literally. No one had ever said that they could ever go to school. Then someone from school said, you can come here and you can learn. And I, and I got a, a, good, a good friend who he lives in Texas now, I grew up with. Um, I tease him all the time because he was one, always one of the first ones to say, you know, Sean, you're trying to act white. You know, he, he was one. He was one of those guys. So, when he got to school, what was amazing was I, I, I had, I think, yeah, I had just finished. I had just finished undergrad, and he was living in the Raleigh area. He was a student at Shaw, at Shaw University in Raleigh. And I took, brought him to our apartment, and I say, I said, look, man, um, I said, remember how you used to say all that, all, all that when we was in high school about, you know, I was acting white. And, and Sean, why you always trying to act white and, and so forth? I said, what about you? I said, you in school? He started laughing. He started laughing. He said, Sean, let me be honest with you. He said, I never would have thought. College was the last thing on my mind. He said, what got me here? He said, I was literally at a, at a, a college fair that was at the high school. And I went up as a joke. He said, I went up as a joke to Sean's table. And they asked me, who are you? What do you do? You know, what do you do? Do you play the sports or anything of that nature? And he just started talking to him, and, and the lady said behind him, she said, she's like, sir, young man, you can come to school here. You can be a college student here at Shaw. That changed, and it, it just wrong. Something wrong because no one had ever, ever gave him that level of encouragement and motivation, 
and it did something to him to the point where he was like, "Oh, I can I can go." And then they found out he ran he ran long distance uh, long distance track, and he was pretty good. And when they found that out, I was like, "Yeah, we actually got some get some money for you." So he ended up running cross country at Shaw on a partial scholarship uh, while he was there, while he was there. And when I got to the Raleigh area, I said, look, man, you ain't got to worry about nothing going forward. I said, as long as I'm here in Raleigh, I said, you ain't got to worry about nothing. Uh, worry about anything. I said, so if you need something, just call me. I said, I'm working now. <laughs> I said, I'm working now. So I said, you ain't got to worry about nothing. So literally, I would pick, I would pick him up. We would go over to Carolina and we go to BW3s. That's what, that's what, that was on Franklin Street at that time. And, um, that's when they had a 10 cent wing night, uh, on Tuesday, on Tuesday nights. And uh, we would go down. We would go down there to see who we could see because we was like, "Hey, we don't care about cancer. We love to see anybody. We love to see guys on the football team, basketball team, so forth." So we we made that a ritual. Like, every Tuesday night, we knew six thirty. We had we had to Franklin Street, you know, head to Franklin Street and so forth. And it was also to be able to give him motivation because I was sitting on a word processor and I had had I didn't need it anymore. I had it for school, but I didn't need it anymore. And he didn't have. A computer, and I was like, "Dude, here's word processor." And then I gave him instruction man. I said, "Look, write your paper, write the rest of your papers on this." <laughs> so you, you just never know what level, what level of gathering you may get based off giving someone hope, the invitation. Now they go on Paul and Silas are doing. That's exactly what they're doing. They're not just making these trips just to be going. Their intention is to motivate and encourage people and to show them the path towards salvation because it helped them. And if it helped them, it can help someone else. So we, we have to figure out ways to better do church. Because doing church is not Sunday morning and it's not what we're just doing right now. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. We have to figure out ways. And I believe, you know, Deacon Melissa, you're right. We, we've got to canvas the area. We have to canvas and figure out a way to get to people and be face to face with them and figure out what it is that, that what, what are the concerns? You know, what, what, what are the issues in the, in the community? And, and what can we address? And a lot of this stuff is real base food, clothing. I mean, you know, things that we probably could, could help with in some fashion immediately. Now, we can't supply everything, but we know that we can we can do something from that perspective. And then that's where you find the, that's with the partnerships. If you can find partnerships to be able to do various things, that actually helps to build what you're doing. Because if someone has resources, someone wants to say, hey, I see what you're doing. Can I give this? Can we partner and do this particular project or whatnot and make this a regular thing? But one of the things that these missionary journeys teaches us is being able to do that, but also it shows being able to know that for as much good as you attempt to do, the devil is always tracking. The devil is always tracking. And, and this is why I will never, the church is alive. It's alive and it's well. So there's no recourse in my mind to relegate the church to being insufficient, deficient, or dead. It can't be because of who we, who we worship. So that's why I always push. I don't care if it's three people here. Two or one. We're going to continue to do what thus saith the Lord because we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in God and the Holy Spirit. And because of those connections, it leads us to continue to pour life where death may be resonant or where near death may be resonant. Sister Terrell McDuffie, you said something here. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what matters is being a blessing for someone else. And that's what truly matters. It's truly being a blessing. That's why we're here. That's why this church exists. It's to be a blessing for someone else. Every church is open in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why they're here. That's why we're here. Is to be able to do that. And to do it consistently. Okay? Um, as you see in this, in this passage, um, it says some of the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up 
some bad characters from the marketplace. You know, there's always some folks that want to rap, you know, cause trouble. <laughs> Formed a mob and started a riot in the city, and they rushed to Jason's house. Now, we don't know who Jason is, but what we do know is he was boarding with Paul and Silas. He was staying, that, uh, not he was boarding, but Paul and Silas were boarding with him. They were staying at his house. And so what they did was they went to Jason's house trying to find Paul and Silas, didn't find them. Didn't find them, but said, okay, Jason, um, since uh, we know that you housed them, um, they were ready to literally beat them up. And also, um, it said that Jason was the one, since then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So they did get Paul and Silas, but they made Jason pay the bond. They made him pay the bond. And, and, and all this really see, t tells us one thing. <sighs> when, when you're trying to do the goodness of God in the midst of worship, in the midst of evangelism, in the midst of mission, you can rest assured that you're going to have a contingent that just doesn't want you to get that word out. And they're going to do everything possible. See, you, you see how easily they get offended? They got offended? Nobody touched them. Nobody, nobody harmed them physically. But because of the truth of the gospel that was being preached, it caused fear. And that fear resonates in what? Violence. Violence. And, and it's amazing how when you're trying to do the goodness of God, how violent people can be, and even church folk. So it makes me wonder, like, why are you being this much of an antagonist for what you already know or should know from the perspective of what we're doing? Or really, do you know it all? But what is this all about? Is this a game? Is it, is it form, a fashion? What, what is it? Because we're trying to transform lives by way of the cross, by way of Christ. That's why we're here. I hope that's why everyone is here. Not for some show. You can go to the Coliseum for that. <laughs> you can go to Spectrum for that. It's not a show. We're trying to transform lives here by way of the salvation of Jesus Christ. But you're still going to have that contingent of people that are always going to try to come up against you. And really, remember, remember, you try the spirit by the spirit. It's not, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of outer darkness. That's what we wrestle with. It's not people. It's the spirit, the spirit they're carrying. And we see that from that perspective. Even when you're at work, you try to show the goodness and project the goodness of the Lord in your spirit. There's someone who has a Completely contrite spirit, reverse of the spirit you're trying to exhibit in order to pull your spirit exactly to the gutter, exactly where their spirit is. Yet another reason why we come to this place. Because we're able to cast our cares upon him who cares for us. And that's important. That's important. I don't know how many hellhounds I had to deal with just today. Just today, just today, by the time five o'clock was coming around, I was on, with, on the phone with two of my coworkers from Canada. And I told them, I said, I said, you know what, y'all? I'm tired. <laughs> I said, but we'll get through it. At some point, we'll just get through it. I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs> it left it, it left it as that. Day, and you wondering how many leaks I can get in before the police show up. <laughs> you know, I, I, I work with this lady, and I told her, I said, sometimes I think you let your evil twin come in because a lot of times she's, I say the sky is blue, she says yellow. I don't know. She is just that she is always, she's got to always be right, uh, even when she won't. And I'm looking and I'm saying, you know, I'm, when I'm trying to do right, 
I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to do better with the way I talk to people. Um, I've cut back 99.99% of my cussing, you know. But it's still this one thing. I don't like it when people are combative against me, especially if I know what I'm talking about. So when I say, okay, um, whatever you say, I'm, I'm done. I, I can't do this. And I go sit down and she say, no, no, I'm not trying to make you angry. I'm listening to you. No, thank you. Got this. <laughs> not listening. And I think you really are trying to get me frightened. <laughs> you know, but it's not going to work. I thank God for how far I've come in my Christian walk or my walk with God. But then sometimes I feel like I still have so far to go when I'm working with people who say that they are Christians. But you keep coming up against me. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I, if we're trying to walk the same walk, why are you coming up against me? I don't, I don't get it. it, I, it it's hard to understand. And, and this this is where I, I know for me I get I just get comfort in, in the word of God that there's no there's no need for, for us to be quarrelsome, to, to quarrel. Because one, I, as I get older, I, I realize that that I cannot allow my blood pressure to go for so high. You know, and, and, and to the point I gotta pull back and say, you know what, is it even worth the argument? It isn't even worth the argument because I, 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 at, at some point I just have to lay it down and give it to God and just and, le and just leave it there. And I think sometimes it's very difficult to do that as you continue, you know, when you're when you're being when you're dealing with this. And I think that as you continue to mature in faith, it begins or continues a process where you find avenues. Where even the word of God says, where, where God says he will create a place where you can lead and where you can escape, where you can escape and where there will be room enough to be able to do it so that you won't sin against, against God and compromise the aspect of, of your faith. Um, that's a process. That sanctification process is real. And I tell people, sanctification process is moving upward, yes, but it's moving upward with dips. <laughs> it's moving upward with dips. Because you're going to have dips and then it's going to come back up, but you're still going up, but you're dipping from time to time. But it's still going up. And this is why it, it for us, we have to always continue to pray. Forgiveness is, there's, oh man, I love Desmond Tutu's book, There's No Future Without Forgiveness. One of the best books I've ever read. And, and it helped me to understand and dealt with, of course, apartheid. But only, not, not only did it deal with apartheid, it dealt with South African apartheid after the fact. When now you got individuals who killed all these black folk or mutilated them in some way. All of, the, all of these South Africans. And the families now have to come behind all this and say it was him, it was her, it was him, it was him that did it. And then with that, to have someone be an intermediary and say that you can't be retaliatory. You can't. You can't retaliate against them. You can't. You can't retaliate against them because because now if they killed your brother or your sister or they mutilated them, now what justice is it if you mutilate them? And that's the thing that Desmond Tutu had to deal with when when they brought him on this council. Because he said one of the first things that needs to happen to get to the reconciliation in this country, in South Africa, he said those who have been, those, those who have been accosted, those who have been brutalized, those who have been beaten and punished and chastised, cannot, they can't go forward without true forgiveness. And true forgiveness means that they don't retaliate against those who did their family harm or even even possibly even killed them. And he said that was one of the hardest things for a lot of people in South Africa, a lot of South Africans, because they knew this person shot my dad and killed him. And, and this is the very reason when you look even our own country, 
you know, with the aspect of slavery is that, man, you, you in your heart, you want to hurt somebody. Your flesh wants to hurt somebody. But at the same time, our Christian all says, Woo, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, 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 you, and you take this, and it's, and it's hard to get to that place. I'm sorry, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to get to that place. Because all you're thinking about is the pain that this spirit caused. Rather than looking at and still seeing that individual as an image, made in the image of God, but still doesn't really realize it and know it. And that right there is what really grips you. So I think there's a way to talk through it, to still give and give forgiveness, but also to never forget it either. Because that's what people oftentimes would do is say, no, we need to forgive. Yeah, we need to forgive, but we ain't for we're not forgetting. Because if we forget, then that could happen again. So that needs to be played. That sin needs to be placed in exposition. It needs to be exposed for what it is. So that prayerfully no one else will do it again. Um, let's go. I'm going to go through these last verses here. It says, as soon as it was night, <laughs> the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. So they had to get out of town. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. See, hear that again? They went to the Jewish synagogue. They went, as soon as they got to Berea, they went and found the church. Now, the Berean Jews were more noble, a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. So they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent uh, Greek women and uh, many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Now you see, Timothy is with them now. Now you remember that whole issue they had when Paul didn't want Timothy to come, but now Timothy now has met back up with them. So prayerfully some of this, the issues they had hopefully were squashed now. You remember when, 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 uh, when, when, um, when uh, Paul took Silas, Barnabas took Timothy, and they, they went in different directions because Paul said, um, nope, not Timothy, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, forgive me, you know what I said, forget what I just said, because that was John Mark, forgive me. So we, we see Timothy now, who now comes on the scene with regards to ministering the gospel, okay? And it says that... Um, Timothy and they stayed, uh, uh, Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Paul, for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So this, this running again, because now you got these folks in Thessalonica that followed them to Berea and they raising up stuff. <laughs> they raising Cain in Berea. Because the folks at Thessalonica, these Jews, they said, oh, well, he, he, he doing the same thing he did back here. Let's let them know. Because when you're trying to do the good for God, not everybody's happy. <laughs> Satan surely isn't. And anybody carrying that spirit definitely isn't. But it still presses forward. And then what you see here is that what we're in tonight is that now Paul begins the process of actually going into Greece itself. And not just Greece, but one of the places in Greece, probably one of the heartbeds of Greece, which is Athens. These, these are the ones that look at the church talk about me, right? Is that what you are? So, so the, Bere the Bereans, uh huh. So, you, whenever you hear, so whenever you hear, uh, hear Berea and Bereans of the Berean church, that's this is where it comes from. That's where you, where you get that from. Now, remember, Berea, this, this is really Gentile country. You got to keep this in mind. It's Gentile country, but they're Jews that are there. So that's why they go to the Jewish synagogue. But remember where they're traveling. And I wish I could show the map. Because when you see the map, you'll see exactly. They're in that area basically called Macedonia. It's basically right around the area where Greece is. It's just east of Greece. And then when they go down a little further, you're actually in Greece. You're actually in Athens. 
at that point. And they believe, do they believe that we do? And just call their hands or do they have a different belief? I, 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 have to look, I have to look look that up because Forgive me for not having an answer to this, but I, I will have to look it up because there are there are Bereans, um, and it makes me wonder if they if they were a sect possibly of 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 of, Jew, of, of Jews, um, maybe nationalistically. I'm not really for sure, I, and I've got to look that up. So forgive me for not having that answer, but I, um, I think I think I know where to go to get it. Um, but you do hear of the Berean, the Berean, you know, Berean church. And certain churches are, are named, you know, Berean, Berean Baptist Church or something of that nature. And a lot of it's come, it comes from right here in, in the book of Acts. But I wanted to see if there's any uh, nationalistic or ethnic pieces that are tied to that name. I need to look that up. Definitely need to look that up. And with that, that is all that I have for tonight. Um, definitely nothing else for tonight that I have. Um, you got me kind of wrestling with that question, Deacon Melissa. <laughs> and that's a good thing, actually. Because now, now I gotta, I gotta open it and find that. But uh, I'll, I'll let you. I'll definitely let you know. And. Um, uh, and definitely next time we meet, this is that uh, I'll, I'll talk about that and, and the aspect of Berean, because uh, there is some history behind it. I just don't know the extent, the extent of it. Okay, I'm done teaching tonight. I pray that you enjoyed Bible study tonight. Um, again, uh, we'll be back on next week uh, to continue going through. We'll start at verse number 16. That's where we'll be in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. All right. So with that, I want to have a word of prayer so we can dismiss on tonight. Let us pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this study on tonight. And thank you, Lord, for what you have given us, Lord, Lord, to study uh, and what we have imparted, Lord, in regards to your word. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you bless us, Lord, as we uh, leave this place, but not from your presence. And give us mercies, O oh God, for the remainder of this day. We love you and praise you in all things. Lord, continue to bless our households, bless us, O oh God, and give us the strength to carry forward, uh, Lord, as long as your will says so, so that we can continue to do the work of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, in whose name I pray and ask all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. May God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Again, we're First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Y'all take care and be blessed.